Mark mentioned, I'm Luis. I come from Braga. This is a picture of a church in my city. Um, but on to my talk. So uh, the, the title I eventually I, I submitted was, was a bit too big to fit in the slide. So I cut it down to the main three topics I'm going to talk about, uh, which I feel are all related to each other. And that's kind of what I'm going to, to talk about here. It's about productivity, learning, and teaching. Um, ways I've managed to, or I, I think are good, to uh, improve all of these uh, in your life and how they can relate to each other, okay? So let's start with uh, productivity. Uh, and the first thing uh, I want to talk about here is trying to define what is productivity, okay? Because um, learning and teaching, I think, are easier uh, to, to define. So learning, you can simplify it as you're starting here by not knowing knowing something, and you end by knowing something. So whatever happens in between doesn't really matter. And in teaching, hopefully, someone else starts starts by not knowing something, and you help them uh, get to knowing that something. But what about productivity? That's harder to define. So I looked it up um, on the Wikipedia page, and um, I'm not going to read all of this, but it basically says that it's a measurement of efficiency. And that's output per unit of input. That's how you measure the, the efficiency of uh, productivity. But what is this, right? So what is output? What is input? Is it lines of code? Don't really know. So and this is actually the economics definition of productivity. So probably doesn't apply. Let's look at, the, again, from Wikipedia, the programming productivity um, definition. And uh, that takes quantity of soft software per cost of software. But again, what is quantity of software? Is it lines of code, lines of uh, tests, lines of code without bugs, number of features that clients are happy with? Again, this is um, too hard of a problem and too, too much of a philosophical problem for us to discuss, I think, in 20 minutes, which or like 20, 15 to 20 minutes, which, which is what I'm going to spend in this section. So I'm going to talk about something that I call perceived productivity. And the definition for that is that you're going to reach the end of the day happy and confident that you did a good job. So you completed the task you, you, you had set up for that day, you're happy, and you can go home, have quality time with by yourself, your friends, your family, your dog, whatever, without feeling guilt that there's something you needed to do today that you didn't. Okay. Um, quote Game of Thrones here, like, who said this? Me, right now. So, uh, I couldn't find a, a, the definition of this, but this is exactly what I wanted to talk about. Uh, there's a couple of things uh, I have been doing uh, lately to try and um, achieve this, and that's what I wanted to share uh, with you today. So, the first thing that um, I think is very important is to plan your day. Like, this is something I started to do, started to do recently, and has really improved um, my productivity or the way I feel about it. So this is very important for me. And um, I'm going to go over like a couple of steps you can do to plan your day. So first one uh, I would recommend is list all your tasks for the day. So this is uh, I usually did do this um, the day before. Okay, you just write them down wherever you want. Just have a list of all the, the tasks. Next step is to prioritize those tasks. Okay. You can do this uh, in um, a lot of ways. I'm going to show you two ways uh, you can do this. Um, there's one inher inherent way, kind of uh, implicit, that is you just do it ad hoc. You just put whatever you think is more important, just put it to the, like, the top of the list. Um, but there are two more organized ways I'm going to talk about. First one is called ABC analysis. Uh, it has like a fancy name, but it's pretty easy. It's just like you give a, no, um, a letter to each task, and A means urgent and important, B important but not ur urgent, and C uh, unimportant. So as you can probably imagine, if you give a C to a task, you can probably just drop that task because it's not important. Uh, this is often um, put together with uh, the Pareto rule, uh, which says that you should get, like 20% of the work should get you to 80% of your goal. So you can put the 20% tasks that will get you those 20% uh, at the top. So this is one way. The other one is a bit more complex. 
It's called the Eisenhower method, uh, and comes from this quote from Dwight Eisenhower. And basically, it divides your tasks into four quadrants. Uh, so urgent and important, not urgent and important, urgent and not important, and not, not urgent and not important. So looking at each of one of them, urgent and important means like your house on fire. So these are like big issues that you have to take care of right now. Uh, and the idea is that if you don't do them right now, at least plan them to be first. And this is something you have to do personally. You have to do it yourself. Uh, this uh, quadrant, like not urgent and important, is like recreation, exercising, this planning of the day, like, this is important, but you don't have to do it right now. So you can set a deadline for them and do them personally again. Urgent and not important. These are like interruptions, meetings. This uh, is stuff that you should delegate if possible. So if you don't have to attend a meeting, delegate so someone else, okay? Not urgent and not important. This is busy work time wasters, stuff that doesn't really matter, um, you should try to drop these activities as much as possible. Now, once you have the, like your all the tasks for the day, they are prioritized, it's important to write them somewhere that you won't forget, right? Uh, for this, I use a tool called uh, Action Ally. I don't know if you heard of it. I, I think it's a Mac-only tool, uh, but there you can use anything. Um, this one, I, it's really nice. It has an overlay over your screen, so whenever you're not doing anything, it, you, your tasks are just there in your face, uh, so you don't forget them. I really, highly recommend it. It's, uh, it's a paid app, but it's um, like a one-time payment, so if you use it every day, it's, it's a good deal. Um, another thing that I would like to recommend is do not set times for each task, okay? I, I think it's very hard to plan, plan your day in terms of, I, I'm going to do this task first, and I'm going to do it from... 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Um, this will set, set you up for fail, uh, for fa failure, I think, because you're going to go over time on some tasks. Some are going to like be shorter. And what what if you have a, an hour and it takes half an hour? Are you going to go on, on Twitter for the other half? Like it's not a good way uh, to plan your, plan your day, I think. And um, I also think that we should be getting better at time management, so doing more with your time and not at time allocation or estimation. Uh, I think that's a hard problem that we don't want to solve in our lives, per se. So time management, I, I feel, is important. So you have your tasks, and you should manage your time to be able to accomplish that task, those tasks. That's the more important thing. Um, in terms of time management, like this sound like get things done, OK? So this sounds like very, uh, very basic thing. Uh, but if you prioritize your tasks correctly and you consistently get things done, uh, you'll be in a very good place at the end of every day. Okay? And I, I, try to, I stress this because sometimes you're, you're focusing on a lot of stuff and you forget like, to get things done. Um, one way I like to do this is, um, I don't know if you've heard of the Pomodoro Technique, but uh, it's, uh, and it's, uh, this is an adaptation of that. Like it has, the Pomodoro Technique has a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just going to focus on one uh, major thing about it. And it basically just sta states that you should do around 25 minutes of uninterrupted work. This means, like, forget everything else in the world. Focus on uh, the unit of work you have at hand, so your, your task. And then take five minutes break, uh, five minutes break uh, to celebrate, to uh, stretch your legs, talk to someone else, like if someone wanted to interrupt you then, ask them to interrupt you when you finish with the, your Pomodoro, okay? Uh, Action Ally, the tool I just mentioned, uh, also allows you to do this. Uh, for each task that you have planned, you can say, I want to do like 25 minute work, and it, it will set up an alarm like five minutes before to let you know it's ending and stuff like that. Uh, now, this is all nice and theoretical, but what if you, like I do, what if you work in an open space? Like, how can you achieve 25 minutes of uninterrupted work? I bet if you have worked in an open space before, you felt the pain of, like, having a lot of noise, a lot of people around you. Um, one thing that I feel is important when you are uh, working in a setup like this is to be able to control your interruptions. Okay? So you can, it, people can interrupt you, but on your own terms. 
first thing um, I would say is to set alarms. I set alarms for like everything, so you don't forget. Like, if you're doing Pomodoros, like after 25 minutes, you have an alarm. Um, if you need to do something at like one hour after, set an alarm. Okay. Like someone wants to talk to you, set an alarm to talk to them whenever you're able to. Um, Slack, uh, we use Slack internally, and Slack has a, a functionality for this. Uh, it has like a, a remind command that you can just say, remind me of whatever at this time, and it will remind you. So that's, I use, that's how I use alarms, but again, anything, you can use your phone, alarms, whatever, um, but do set those alarms. This is good uh, for another reason, that is, uh, it takes your mind off of the things that you should do at that time. Once you set an alarm, you can forget it. Like, once the alarm goes off, you can think about it again. So this kind of clears your mind to work, work on the, um, what you're working on at the moment. Uh, again, I think it's very important to be responsive on your own terms uh, when working in an open space environment. And this means that you should um, have a way to communicate to your team that you're not available. Okay. It can be like you have your headphones on, that means do not disturb. Uh, there are a couple of um, products right now in the market, like for um, the uh, one that's just uh, like a piece of stick, stick like a stick, like a piece of wood, um, that has two colors, like red and white, and you just turn it around. Like there's a lot of stuff you can do to just say, I'm available. Uh, set do not disturb on Slack. Slack has the functionality now. Or quit, in, quit it entirely. Just quit Slack when you're not available. Uh, if you can, go to a separate office. Uh, if not, that's bad. But um, be sure to explain the, those signals to your team. Like, do not assume that they know be, that because you have headphones, you don't want to be distur disturbed. Okay? Like, talk to your team and let them know, if I have my headphones on, do not disturb me. But one thing that I also feel is important uh, to, like, for you to be able to be responsive on your own terms is to not always be offline. Okay? Like, uh, be um, aware that if you're working in a team, that team might need you sometimes. So if you're doing a pom the Pomodoro technique, it's easier. You have every 25 minutes, you have five minutes. But I'll say at least every hour, take some time to look at, at what people want from you. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be hard, at least in my experience, it's going to be hard to work in a team. Um, one thing that um, I, I feel personally, and I, I think a lot of people do, uh, about setting not disturb on Slack or quitting Slack is something called the fear of missing out, um, also known as FOMO. And I think like you really need to try to control that. For one of the main reasons, uh, that's probably one of the main reasons you don't want to leave Slack in the first place, because you think something super exciting is going to happen and you're going to miss it. There's a, uh, there's actually now a product called, uh, not a product, like a, a project, an open source project called FOMOBOT that you can put in your uh, Slack, like Slack channels, and uh, it will measure activity on like, how many people are talking, and if it's like more than three or more people talking a lot more than usual in that channel, it'll let you know. So that's probably something interesting happened. So if you're uh, afraid of that, you can use FOMOBOT. Um, but in general, if something really matters, you will know about it. Okay? If there's something on fire, someone will get up and tell you, like, hey, you need to really work on this right now. Um, so it, it's usually okay. Uh, if you turn off your email, your Slack for long stretches of time, like if something really matters, you'll know about it. One other thing that I find, um, and I have, to be honest, a hard time doing this still, but I think is important um, in order to be productive, is to have daily routines. This is often perceived as bad, like to have um, like something that you do like it's every day, the same thing. But they are very good for productivity. This is things that you do not need to figure out every day. If you do them the same way every day, you don't need to think about them. For instance, for instance, have a routine that means it's time to work. Um, lately, like about two months ago, I started doing uh, what I call daily stand-up videos, pretty much for myself. But I, I basically uh, record myself uh, on like I have a stand-up with myself, saying like 
what I've done yesterday, what I'm doing, doing today, and what's blocking me. I record a video, about a minute video, video, and I put it in a Slack channel so everyone on my team can see like what I'm doing if they want. But it's, al it's also something that I do every day before going to work. So for me, it just switches uh, my mind into like work time. Uh, it's also good to have a routine that means time to switch off. Um, I know some people that uh, just like um, put their everything uh, on the right order in the desk and they just say computer switch off or whatever. Like just have something uh, in your life that means start working, stop working, or else you're 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 in the, in the risk of just working all day and all night. Um, get up and go to bed at the same time. I have a hard problem with this, but it would be nice if you have a routine there. Um, famously, uh, Steve Jobs and now Mark Zuckerberg have the, this routine of always dressing the same way, like because that's one less one less thing that they have to think about every day. Uh, so just clear your head and do whatever you have to do. A bit apart, and now these more focused, more focused uh, for uh, like developers, which I think most of you are. Um, I think uh, your editor should be there to help and not to fight you. So regardless of the editor you use, I think you should be able, able to uh, run tests from your editor, assuming that you have a test suit that I think most people do or that you do TDD, especially important. But running your tests from the editor, if you have to leave the editor to run your tests, that's painful, I feel. Um, you should be able to extract repetitive tasks into shortcuts. I think most editors support this, so do try to be con conscious about stuff that you do every day um, that's boring, repetitive, like busy work, and put that into shortcuts. Um, you should, should be able uh, to change files at the pace of your thoughts. And um, this, I think this is important. There are a lot of like fuzzy searchers now for editors. This is very important. Like if you have to keep thinking about uh, where, hey, where's, what's the structure of the, the project, where's that file, that's just time wasted. And um, I think you also should, if you haven't, you should learn to touch type. Uh, it's also a major productivity booster, at least it was for me, when I took some time to actually kind of not look at the keyboard. Um, but so any editor that you use, uh, please try to do this, I think. And there's more things. I think these are the more, most important ones. So um, wrapping up this section of the talk, the m main things I, would, I think are uh, important in terms of improving your productivity every day is to plan it. I cannot stress this enough. Planning each day is great. Like, you know what you have to do. You don't have to think about it. And you can see, like, the progress of, uh, of your day going on. Um, and uh, improving your time management skills, I think, is also important. Um, things I've talked about, like the Pomodoro technique and being able to know, like, okay, I'm going to work on this task for this long, in like, uninterrupted, and this is going to go fine. Like, if I, if I work uninterrupted on a task for 25 minutes, like, regardless of where the, the task is in terms of completion, I, I know that I, I gave my best for that for those 25 minutes. And if I do this all day, I can end the day feeling fine because I gave my best the entire day. Like, if I haven't done more, it's because, like, what I can do is not enough to, um, to get to that. Um, so, and, and that kind of links to my, to the next section of this talk, that is, if I'm not, at this point, I'm not good enough to, um, do more with the time that I have, even if I, I can plan a lot and I can manage a lot, but if I just don't have the skills, then I'm not able to, to do enough. So one thing that I, uh, I'm preaching here, uh, is to learn, try to learn uh, every day, every week, all the time. Keep learning so that you can, uh, so this is like a, a feedback loop. So you, you can do more with your time. So you, you're, you can ma manage uh, and do more tasks uh, better. Um, in terms of learning, I'm going to separate this into two uh, subsections. So things you can do as an individual. So yourself, anyone can do this. 
and things you can do uh, in your company. So as an individual, the first thing, again, this seems very simple and uh, very straightforward, but sometimes it's not. Um, just be conscious, conscious and uh, <laughs> sorry, make an effort uh, and take the time to learn. Okay? So if you don't take the time to learn, you'll never be able to learn anything. This seems like very simple, but it's not always. So do I do stress that this is important. One thing that you can try to do, uh, and this will really uh, speed up your learning, is try to find a mentor. It can be in your company. If you, have, if you work in a, a company where you have someone uh, more senior than you or that you look up to, look, up, look like ask them if they can help you out. Um, outside of your company, even internationally, a lot of people, uh, if you reach out to them, we, if they have time, they're more than willing to help you and guide you in like, choosing what to learn. Because I feel that, uh, I think Godfrey talked about this yesterday, I think this is one of the hardest things uh, as someone that's learning is what to learn next. And um, if you have someone with more exper experience that you respect, that's a very good way to, to learn. Um, so if you can, do try to find a mentor. A mentor. Now, in terms of learning, we have a lot of places where we can get uh, input. Like, we can read books, read articles, can listen to podcasts, attend conferences like this one. There's a lot of stuff we can do. Uh, so we, there's a lot of information out there. But how, how do we take the, this information and what we do with it is the most important thing. So there's this, uh, like, dichotomy uh, between learning and doing and how much you should be doing of each. And uh, so when should you s stop learning and start doing? Uh, because um, if, you learn in, if you're just learning, if you're le learning all the time, uh, you're not going to be able to apply it. Like, this, I think this is true for everyone. If you're just learning, you're not learning like the details of it. It's not sticking uh, in your head. Like, you need to apply it as well. So you need to strike a balance here. But it's super hard to know when to stop learning. So when have I learned enough? that I can do something, or when have I done too much that I'm just not doing good work and I need to go back and learn some. Um, I'm a fan of uh, this thing called just-in-time learning, and this is actually a thing. I didn't make it up. Um, and what it states is that you should only learn what you need right now. And the reason for this is that uh, a lot of your knowledge will probably become obsolete. Like if you're, for instance, uh, if you're learning social media, like social media work and uh, SEO stuff, that changes a lot. If you want, if you spend like a month learning it today and you only need to use it like two years from now, it's probably completely outdated. Um, so, and this works for a lot of stuff. Like for instance, I'm now learning Elixir, but the goal is to get client projects in it and to do like real work on it. If I stop working on it, my um, knowledge right now in, an, in a year, will probably be um, obsolete. Okay. Now, that being said, it's always, also important, I think, to not stop learning. Okay. So, uh, these very technical things and specific things, uh, it's good that you just learn them when, you're, um, when you need them. But it's also important that you learn a lot, like from every uh, area of, uh, of life. And, like, go out of your comfort zone, broaden your horizons, because that's uh, where best ideas will come from, okay? So if you learn from a lot of different things, that's the, um, so the mix of areas and uh, domains is, I think, what make the best ideas. So keep re reading books, keep learning stuff, but um, also have in mind that this is not necessarily, so if you're going to read the book, and you don't need it right now, don't necessarily think that you have to understand everything that's there or you have to learn everything that's there. It's more as a, a tool for you to have in the back of your head. If sometime you need it, you know something about it and you can relate to it and you know where you learn that and can go back to that. Uh, this relates a, a bit to what the panel was discussing yesterday uh, about college like and everyone uh, not remembering pretty much anything that happened in college. Um, that's not exactly true. You, you, like, you learn stuff and you can relate back to that if you really need it. 
uh, probably e even if you don't know everything about it right now. Um, as a company, and um, this is if you are in a position of changing your company culture or influencing someone who can, um, there's a lot of stuff that you can adopt, I think, as company-wide practices that will help make, you, make your company uh, a company where people can learn. Um, a lot of this, what I'm going to go through right now, is uh, stuff that we do at uh, Subvisual, my company, and my personal experience. So pairing, um, if you haven't tried it, you should. It's a um, good, especially good way of tackling new problems that you have no idea how, how, to, how to tackle. This is very good to learn. Like, even if you're at the same level, it's good, you're gonna learn something. If it's something, someone that knows less than you, it's also good. You, you're gonna see different things happening. If it's someone more senior than you, it also works. So pairing is a very nice way of learning new uh, ways of working, new workflows, new, like in terms of the development, like new um, commands for the bash that people use that you don't, like new techniques, everything. So I really enjoy pairing people. Uh, in, like now as a company-wide things, uh, we have four hackathons um, a year, and I recommend doing this if you can in your company, just take a full day and do a, a hackathon. Doesn't, it might, some interesting projects might come out of it, uh, but even if not, it's just good for team members that don't usually work with each other to do that. So you have some cross-pollination of ideas and knowledge and I think that that's good, especially if you have a uh, big company with big teams. Like you can, people can know each other, they can relate and learn different things. It's also good to work on different problems, different technologies. So if you're doing mo mostly the same thing every day, this is a, a good way to have an escape from that. Uh, another thing that we do uh, is, uh, I call it development meetings, but like this could mean anything. Uh, what this means is that we hold monthly meetings, and as of late, we started doing something that uh, I've been really enjoying, and it's the, these development meetings are mo mostly, mostly a show and tell moment, where everyone can, can have like five minutes to show a small side project, new technique uh, is learned, so it's a great way again to disseminate knowledge throughout uh, the um, across the company. So very interesting, someone is doing anything, they can just go there, okay, I'm gonna show you this. Um, really enjoying it, highly recommend it. Uh, something we have been doing for a while now, um, we call them Friday talks, you can call them Monday talks, whatever. It's just uh, on Friday, uh, on the lunch, the com company pays, pays for the lunch, and someone, always, um, someone has at least one talk, uh, usually two, about whatever, like this is me speaking, giving, this exact talk um, last week at the Friday talk to prepare it, but uh, anything's uh, good for, for this Friday talk. Every week we have a talk about a topic, big or small, doesn't really matter. Uh, it can be management, it can be anything. So uh, I would also recommend having this as a good way of sharing knowledge. And um, this is because at my company we have, like we're a consultancy, so we have a bunch of small teams working on different projects for clients. And a lot of times, uh, you, we don't work with each other, we have different technologies we're working it with, so it's a, a good way for everyone to be kind of in the same page. Another thing we do um, is uh, book clubs. So, that's pretty much what the name say, says, you choose a book and you read it as a group. And this is good, um, uh, oh, and every week we have a meeting to discuss uh, the chapter we just read. Uh, if it has exercises, we do them and discuss the code. If not, there's other things you can do. But um, this is also a great way to both uh, share knowledge and for me personally, take advantage of peer pressure to finish a book. Um, because as um, uh, there were, was talk, like someone said uh, yesterday, I think Godfrey again, uh, he has, um, I also have the problem of not being able to finish books. Like I start reading them and at some point, uh, th like mid midway, I lose interest, and this is a good way to have someone else like pressure you in a good sense um, to finish th those books. Uh, takeaways for uh, this section of the talk is, again, 
take the time to learn. Uh, be um, aware of balancing learning with doing. Just both things are important. And uh, if you can, use your company as a learning catalyzer to help you grow. Um, it's very good if you're in a company that is interested in helping you grow. Now, I'm going to interrupt this for a mandatory commercial break, uh, where I'm going to talk about my company really fast. So as I said, we're a consultancy based in Braga. We're opening uh, an office in Boston. And so if you're interested in talking more about this or consultancy in general, development, whatever, please do come talk to me. And uh, also we are the organizers of RubyConf Portugal. It's happening in October this year. So the, we, you can buy tickets already. The CFP is open. If you want to submit a talk, please do. Uh, we have a pretty good lineup this, for this year. We have Aaron Patterson, Martin Fowler, who the cats are going to be there. So I think it's a very nice uh, conference. And if you've never been to Portugal, you should definitely go there. That was it. That's the commercial break. Uh, now, on to the last section of the talk. Uh, I'm going to, uh, the smaller one, I'm going to talk about teaching. Um, I, I didn't really talk about myself, but uh, apart from my company, I also teach uh, classes at uh, two different universities, and I, I teach at a local boot camp as well. Uh, so I have some experience teaching people uh, Rails, mostly, but the web in general. And this is some, some of the things I learned and some of the things that um, I want to tell you about learning, uh, teaching, sorry. So the most important thing and the most difficult one, uh, it, it was for me, and I think it's important for everyone that's starting to teach, uh, is to leave your, your ego si aside. Like, when you're teaching, and even right now when, like, I'm giving this conference talk, I'm hopefully teaching you something. Um, this is not about me, okay? This is about you about people that are getting the message. And um, the quicker that you get to that mindset, the better uh, you're going to be able to teach something to someone. Um, this is from a Phil Collins song, but in, in teaching you will learn. Uh, I really truly believe this. This is very cliche, but uh, it ends up being true in most situations. It helps you both get um, out of your comfort zone, helps you get beginner's eye again, uh, beginner's eyes again, which uh, we sometimes lose um, that mentality. Just like you've been working probably on Ruby and Rails for so long that you do not see it from like the, the eyes of someone that's just starting with it. And that's important as well. You, you, you'll be surprised at how much you can learn from that. Um, it also It's also a good way to meet new people uh, if you are like teaching. Uh, in the broad sense of the word, like in conferences, meetups, it's a good, very good way to, to meet new people. Uh, one thing that I would really like to stress, and this is the most common pitfall I think I, I see with uh, people in general, is that they think they cannot teach because they have nothing to teach. Uh, it's never too early to teach, uh, and there is always someone who is just where you were. Like, regardless of what you just learned, there's someone that is trying to learn that, so you can at least teach them. So please do, um, uh, please do teach, teach um, wherever you can. Like it, it can be like a blog post, it can be whatever, like you do a short video, uh, podcast, whatever you want to do, please do it. Uh, the world is better for that, I think, because sometimes the best teachers are not someone, is not someone who knows a lot about a topic because they can be completely distanced of what a beginner uh, needs to know right now. Uh, th I think that's why boot camps a lot of times take alumni from those boot camps and, and integrate them in the teaching, um, so it's like the, the faculty, and, and I think that re works really well. Now, you can say, uh, I have no idea what or where to teach. How do I do that? So in terms of what to teach, like as, I'm, uh, as I said, whatever you're learning right now and you're interested in right now, Teach that, give, like, pay it forward. Now, where to teach? Uh, you can look at the community in general. There's a l loads of places where you can, you can teach. You can te teach at universities, probably the hardest one to get in. Uh, but if you can, go to your, like, if you have a CS degree, go to your university, ask if you can teach. I don't know. Like, there's a couple of things uh, you can do there. But if you can, or, or even, um, so this is my university. It's me giving uh, a crash course on Rails. 
it's not actually a class. So you, there's all these workshops and stuff that you can propose if you knew in uh, your uh, local universities. Uh, you can talk at conferences. Um, there's a lot of conferences, okay? And uh, you can submit talks to to them, and sometimes you get accepted, like I did to come here, which is really nice. You get to know new places, uh, new people. Uh, it's a very good way of uh, sharing and getting something out of it as well. Uh, if there's a, a boot camp where you live, uh, you can try to teach there as well. Uh, we actually created one, and so this is a, a picture from that. So this is, uh, a, again, a way you can teach. This is very intensive uh, if you ever try to do it, but it's a good way to teach uh, people. If you have local meetups, uh, you can you can try and speak there. Um, usually, meetups are desperate to find people to speak. So, this is, if you have one here, this is a very good uh, place to start. And usually, a smaller uh, crowd, and that's a, a place where you can improve your speaking skills, test your talks. So, I again recommend um, talking in meetups. And if there's no meetups, then just start one. That's what we did uh, in in Braga, uh, where I live. Uh, again, Friday talks, coming back to this, uh, a very good way to uh, improve your uh, speaking skills and a very easy way to start uh, speaking because it's in your company to your people that you work with every day. It's very easy to, to get in. Like There's no really no approval process or anything. Like It's pretty easy to talk there. Um, Mentoring, if you can do it, uh, like one-on-one -on -one mentoring, stuff like that. Uh, we have some of it, like we have an apprentice program, and that includes a bit of mentoring. I don't have any pictures, though. But like, if you can and want and feel that you can help someone, please do. There's also events, all kinds of events related to programming where you can uh, teach someone something. Like this is a picture of a uh, coder dojo. I don't know if you've heard of the, um, like this is an international thing to teach programming to kids. And this is uh, happening in my university. Uh, yeah, we also started this. And every Saturday morning, like kids go here and they can learn to code the, now they just got Raspberry Pi and they're gonna do stuff with that. So it's an interesting, uh, another interesting thing you can do if. If it doesn't exist, you can just create it as well. Um, now, takeaways from this uh, section is that I think you should care about your students. As I said, put your ego aside. This is about the, the, the people that are learning. Um, there is always someone you can teach. Like, I see so many people uh, that have very interesting stories to share and very uh, like interesting knowledge, and they're just afraid that no one will care or that is not good enough, like it is, like just share it. And uh, actively look for places to, where you can share that. Now, all this I've said is very good, but uh, it's also okay if you don't want to do any of this. Like, but um, you do have to be prepared to face the consequences of that, uh, which I feel is, or are, uh, that your knowledge can become obsolete or too specific. So, and this becomes very hard then like for you to change jobs or if you get fired, it's very hard to find a new one. Uh, I see a lot of people that just have like, I have this knowledge, this is what I do, I work nine to five and I don't care. And um, that might be problematic or not, but just be aware that that might be a thing. Um, one of the major things that you will not do, I think, is you will, uh, and this I think is important, uh, is that you will not build your personal brand. And um, I don't know if this is stress enough, but having a personal brand is very important. Uh, like being active in social media, and by social media I also mean like GitHub, which is kind of social media right now. But uh, so having open source contributions, being active on Twitter, talking at conferences, putting yourself out there is very good. Like you, you'll know a lot of new people. You put yourself in position to meet new people, probably working uh, at interesting places. And if you ever want to change jobs, you probably can get a better job than you would if you're just sitting at home watching TV. But the, 
most importantly of all, uh, I think you'll miss out on the joy of learning. Uh, at least I feel this every time I learn something new and I can apply it and it works, I'm very happy. So at the end of the day, I think that's the most important thing. You should be proud of what you do. You should be happy. And uh, I think that's what we're all for here. So thanks. <laughs>